We have been declaring an open heaven over our lives and the ministry. But what exactly does that mean? What does that mean to you? What does that mean to me? What does that mean to us as a ministry? So what access do I have now that it's an open heaven over my life? And what can I do now under an open heaven that I had not access before? Because you said in Matthew 21 and 22, Matthew 21 and 22, and whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith for it. And that was before the open heaven, right? Okay. And so then you said in Mark 11 and 23, truly I say unto you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done. That was before my declaration of an open heaven. Then you said in Mark 16, 17 through 18, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with other tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they think, drink anything deadly, it will by no means harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And that's before the declaration. So what can I do now under an open heaven? What does that mean? So let's go to, which brings me to my text, uh, Mark 1 and 13. Oh, look at the graphic. That's nice. Mark 11 and 13. So we know that this is where Jesus baptized John, right? Well, John baptized Jesus. Let me be biblically correct. John baptized Jesus. So Mark 1 and 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to detour him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do it, to do this, to fulfill our righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as John was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open and he saw he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and a a lightning on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son who I'm loved and I'm well pleased. So I've been reading it a lot lately because we've been talking about an open heaven. And so I asked God, what's the significance of a dove? What does that what does that mean? I always ask, what does that mean? By now, y'all know I ask God questions a lot. So what does that mean? So a dove is in, rep- in is representation of peace and gentleness. So once the heaven is open, there should be a level of peace and gentleness that comes to every area of your life. Because you are under an open heaven. And so we know that him being baptized is symbolic of his death. So in essence, this came way before he was he was killed and oh, God got this heal. That came way before. So in essence, Jesus went down carrying us and got up with us in him. So when when God said, this is my son who I'm well pleased I just take it as you were talking about me too, right? Because if 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 I'm coming down, you know, you were carrying me in. But when I came up, I was in you. I was a part of you. So that means when you opened up the heaven and descended the spirit of God down like a dove, you did that for me over my life. So then I kept reading, and I'm like, okay. This is my son whom I'm well pleased. And then it says, the spirit led him to the wilderness. So you're pleased with me. And in your pleasure, you usher me into an uncultivated, uninhabited place. You're pleased with me. And your pleasure led me into an uncultivated and uninhabitable place. So you mean that when you're most pleased with me is probably the time I'm in the most trouble. 
you're the most pleased with me in the places where it seems the driest. You are the most pleased with me when people around me are dying for no reason. People are killing themselves for no reason. People are losing their minds every day. Stuff is dropping, breaking, happening. And you mean to tell me this is the moment you're the most pleased? You ushered me into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights of nothingness. No eating, no drinking, no sleeping, no nothing. As you allowed my enemy to taunt me. So I wonder if your trouble, I wonder if what feels dry, I wonder if what feels like a desert is just your prepping ground for the next level. I wonder if you got up tomorrow morning and didn't think about it as trouble but elevation. I wonder if you get up tomorrow morning and say, oh, this had nothing to do with Satan. This had everything to do with God. So if you sent me, you had your spirit lead me, I'm okay. So peace can abound. I wonder if I just changed my mind. No, it's not dry. The angels are with me. Because Satan came and said, well, if you be who you, who you say you are, then go on and jump off. Jump off. The, come on, jump off. The angels will catch you. Come on, jump off. So I wonder how many times have we sat or I've sat in the last few days and said, God, where are you? What, what's happening? Has anybody said that in the last few weeks? What's happening? What is this? I come to church, there's a move of God, we get home, and there's some tragic news. What is this? What is this? But I wonder if this is all just an expansion of heaven for you. So the Spirit led him to the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for a very long time. And you can read that if you jump back to Mark 1 through 14, um, which is what I want to do. Let's jump back there to Mark 1 through 14. One of the things I didn't write on my paper because I wanted to read it. I'm going to find it. Mark 1 through 14. And I think I'll go, and Jesus, and so this is the part where, so in Matthew, it tells you that he was baptized, in Mark, it tells you he was baptized, but it didn't give you the background story. So you got to jump over to Matthew to see what happened in the wilderness, what all went down. You got to jump back to Mark to find out what happened, you know, what the rest of it was. So I was very interested because I'm like, okay, so... So let's think about it differently. So this is not a dry place. This is not the desert. You opened up heaven, and nowhere in Scripture can I find that you closed it back. So if I can't find that you closed it back, then it's still open. It's been open since that point. It's, heaven's been open since Jesus was baptized. Because I couldn't find where he closed it. Now, I'm not, you know how Bishop say a the, theologian. I'm not, I don't know that I'm that, but I do read my Bible, and I didn't find it. So if you find it, I will stand corrected, but I didn't find it. So I didn't see where he went back and closed it again. It stayed open. So then we get to the part. So I said, okay, so God, what should I be seeing in my life? If this is an open heaven, if this is the season of open heaven, if this is what should be happening, what should be going on in my life? So I went back to Mark 1 and 14, and it says, after, Jesus, after John was put in jail, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So I said, okay. Well, we tell people about Jesus. So there's been some moments 
but has there been a real thrust in my life at this point to be like, hey, you know, Jesus is coming back. We need to, hey, follow me. We, Jesus is coming back. Has there been something in me that really said, I need to stop this person? I need to call just my cousin. I need to speak to my aunt or I need to whomever in my life, especially those close to me. Has there been something on me that says, I, I need to call. I need to say, hey, something's going on and we just need to get it right. Right? So then it says the next thing in 16, and Jesus walked beside the sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting the net into the lake for there were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in the boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father in the boat and with the hired men and followed him. So I said, okay. He left them. He went. He, he just, he's walking by. And he says, follow me. So I said, that's a miracle. Right? To get people to leave what they're doing. And if you're running a boat, if you're fishing for fish, it's messy, right? So to get people to leave their messy and follow me has to be a miracle. So I should have some miracles in my life, right? Because miracles, I looked up miracles because I was really like, what does that mean? A surprising, a surprising, surprising and welcome event that is not explicable to nature or science, scientific laws, is therefore considered to be a work of a divine agency. So as I'm walking through work, somebody should just want to follow me. As I'm going through the grocery store, somebody should, not, should just want to follow me. They should know what's on me. They should know what I'm carrying. They should want to know what I'm carrying. And then I went on. It says, then... Jesus drives out an impure spirit. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because, as, he, as the teachers of the law, just then a man from the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit called out, what do, you want, what do you want from us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. So I said, well, then that must be the wonder. And then I was and so like, no. No, that's not the wonder. Okay, so if, if that's not a wonder, then that's a sign. So because I'm under an open heaven, miracles should be happening, and then signs should there follow. So I should, not only am I saying to a thing to come out, now me saying it, you know how we go into these long declarations? Now it's just be quiet. So this thing that's just out of control, be quiet. And upon its quiet, that's a sign to you. I said, so, okay, God. So there are miracles that should be following. There should be somebody following me. There should be somebody who's willing to know what it is and why it is that, I'm, that this is happening to me. Also, that there are signs. There are signs to follow. So I'm, I'm saying something. But it's not, if I can say, the labor intensive that we do. The just, we just get on our knees and stay for 10 days asking God to do something. Because when Jesus, I fully believe when Jesus got out of the water, he got out with an open heaven confidence. And that confidence allowed him to do more in action and say less with word. 
So all he said was, be quiet. And everybody else took care of the rest. So this cousin tells that cousin. And that friend tells that friend. She just came and sat in my house. And peace came. She just called me. And she declared peace in my house. And it came. So that's, we have the miracles. We have the signs. Which signs are an object, a quantity, or an event whose presence or occurrence indicates the probable presence of something bigger than yourself. So me saying, be quiet to a situation, and it steals, and it gets quiet, lets everybody else know, God is here. So I should have miracles, signs, and so I said, okay, well, we, you know, Let's apply this to modern day times. And, you know, after that, it's miracle signs and wonders. So what's the wonder? So, I'm, you know, what, what I'm going to do? Because you know how sometimes you believe fully in other people's anointing? Like, we believe Bishop can say something and it's going to happen today. At the a point of impact, at the point it comes out of his mouth, it's going to happen. But do you believe that's what's going to happen for you? Do you believe you're going to say something and it's actually going to change? Do you believe you have that kind of power? So it says, 29, Mark 1 and 29, as soon as they left the synagogue and they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew, Simon's mother-in-law was in the bed with fever and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. Then fever left and and she began to wait on them. He took her hand. She got up. Fever is gone. Now she tends to them. So that has to be a wonder. He just touched her. At that point, he didn't even open his mouth. He just touched her. So under an open heaven, you mean to tell me I have the ability to create miracles, signs, and wonders? Under an open heaven, we're just not expecting God to move. God is expecting you to flex your power. You have, an, you have an ability here that you may not have known was once present that now you can flex your abilities. You can now speak to a thing. And if speaking is not what you want to do, you can now touch the thing. And it should do what you have required. So that must mean, because the Bible also says we're made in the image and the likeness of God. So if God was a miracle worker, what am I? If God was a miracle worker, if he's a sign and a wonder, what am I? I got up in him. He is baptized, raised up in him, so now I'm a miracle worker. So nothing comes in my presence needing fixing that cannot be restored. So now I'm a sign generator. I'm, I'm going to generate for you what God can do. I'm going to generate, I'm going to show you what God can do. And then turn around and make you stand in awe of him. Because that's what wonder means. To stand in awe. So when I visit you in the hospital and I just touch your hand. And something changes. It's a sign. That God is a wonder. That's a sign. That something's shifting. I don't believe we really understand, or maybe it's just me, so I'll use me. I really didn't understand the power I had when I opened my mouth or the power I had not to open it. There is a power on both ends, depending upon how you're wielding it. So I might open my mouth 
that may not be a blessing to you. But this might be a time where I keep my mouth shut and God will move. What end are you on? Better said, what motive do you have? What motive do you have for opening your mouth right now? What motive do you have for keeping quiet right now? Because if your child was sick, or your sister, your friend, your cousin, and you could say something to fix it, would you say it? But if that same person was sick and it required you to be quiet, to maybe get out of the way of their consequence, could you be quiet and not feel the pressure to have to come up with something? You have to be careful how you wield the power God has given you because you could mess somebody up getting in their way. There might be something more for them and your silence is going to drive them to Jesus instead of always coming to you. You saying, talk to God about it, will drive them to him versus you always having an answer. And you can always know when it's you because every time they call, they tire you out. That's you. Because if they call and if it was God, he'd give you something. You wouldn't be pulling at old messages. You wouldn't be pulling at stuff trying to piece it together to get them through to the next week, to the next mistake, and they're going to call you again. You have to be careful of the power that you have in this season. Be mindful of what your words say. Be mindful of who you give your time to. Even more so under an open heaven. Because the spirit can choose to step away. Your, if he descended like a dove, he can ascend back to where he came from like one. So you can get in a position where you're no longer spirit led. And I'd much rather be in the wilderness with God than flailing out there by myself because I didn't understand the power I was yielding. I didn't understand the essence of the control that needed to be had by myself. I didn't understand that if God thought and spoke, he could have so if I think and speak, I can have. So the things that you can have, the things that you are, the things that under an open heaven is one confidence. There should be a new level. You should, you should be able to say something and believe it. There should be, there should be almost, not arrogance, but there should be something on you that says, we're going to do this. I can say this and it's going to change. I can say that and it's going to happen. And you can walk away from it knowing it's going to happen. There should be something on the inside of you that's hearing more clearly what God is saying. Like how you know sometimes it's kind of, well for me, I'll just use me. Sometimes it's a little foggy, and I'm like, God, did you say that? Is this me, or is this you? Did I hear that? Did we do that? Um, okay, well, I'm just going to wait. Okay, I'm not going to do it. Or okay, I'm not going to. It should be crystal clear. This is what God said. So one is confidence. Two, your hearing should be defined. Your hearing should be so in tune. Just even if, even at the point of, okay, God, I heard that. Just at work, 
just going to, I think a lot of times, sometimes we think the only time you can hear God is when you open your Bible. But what I'm learning for myself is that when I get up in the morning, invite, invite the Holy Spirit into my day, that some things shift. Some things, some things change. Like, I have a better day. Like, and I'm the person who tried it. So I got up, and I'm like, okay, it's Holy Spirit, have you? And I, it, tell me, do this, get this, have that, and ask for this, get that, do this. The days I don't, it's like running around here with a chicken with my head cut off. Like, okay, I got to do this. Okay, I got to do that. Okay, I got to do this. And you're overwhelmed. And over, being overwhelmed is just really stress hidden under another name. Overwhelmed is stressed. It's just, they just gave it a different name. It produces the same stuff. They just called it something different. Because sometimes people have to have different words. When they don't want to say they're stressed out, they tell you something like, well, I'm just overwhelmed. That's stress. So, here we go. Your hearing should be more defined. Confidence is first. Your hearing should be more defined. There should be a new level of power. There's, there's, there's miracles flowing. Like somebody's willing to follow you. Somebody's willing to hear you. Somebody's willing to drop their mess and pick up what you got going on, which is Jesus. I hope that's what you have people pick up. Pick up Jesus. Then there should be some signs. Something should be shifting because your presence something should be happening because of your presence and then of course you always get wonders well they will stand in awe of God you'll know if none of that's happening if everybody is giving you the glory and nobody's mentioned anything about God you know where you are Then two, you have to fully be, you have to fully understand the type, the kind, and the force of power that you have. That you are indeed a miracle worker. That you are indeed, if we knew your story, you're a sign and a wonder. If we really, if we really let you talk. And if you really were in a zone where nobody was going to, and we really let you talk, and nobody was going to judge you, you're a sign and a wonder. So under this open heaven, now I've become, now I am a miracle worker. Now I am a sign and a wonder. There should be all kinds of stuff and I asked God because I was like there should be a little more under open heaven because don't that sound serious to y'all don't that sound like that's really intense okay some really intense things should be happening more than just my intense feeling that I'm in this desert more than that should be happening more than that should be going on so as we go back and then I'm really, I'm really done. Can y'all believe that? I'm really done. I'm really done. Proud of myself. So real, uh, open heaven, I wanted to know what benefit did I have? What benefit was for me? Under this open heaven, God, what is in this for me? Like, I understand miracles. I understand signs. I understand wonders. What is in this for me? So confidence. Was the first thing. You should say something now and be able to know it's going to happen. Two is your hearing should be redefined. God should just be dropping some things. Like you just in the middle of the night at your job. and you, you, I just, I'm hearing it. I hear you. Whether it's about your purpose or whether it's about your next step, whether it's about your children, whatever it is, you should be hearing there should be miracles, signs, and wonders to follow. Something should be moving. Something should be affected by your presence. Something should be happening. Like if you walk in a room and everybody's still comfortable, 
you should be uncomfortable. Especially if you walk into a room and something's not going the way it's supposed to go. And nothing's shifting and nothing's uncomfortable. And I'm saying it to myself because, of course, I had to preach this to me first. So I'm like, how often do I walk into a room and something is wrong and it changed? Has that ever happened for me? Did I really understand what was coming out of my mouth? Did I really what, understand what I was saying over somebody? And then you have to be, and I, 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 I heard this this morning as somebody called me with something and we're talking about something. I have to be, you have to be really careful what you call people, what you say over people when they're in a position of stumble. You have to be really careful what you say and, and what you do and how you treat when you know somebody has visibly fallen. When you know that they're, they're at a fail, that they missed it. Because the power that you have can leave them with a label. And me saying it to the person is different because they can shake, they can cast that off. But if I say it to him or if I say it to a friend and we get agreement, then he has to fight through that and he don't know why. So she should have known better, and they shouldn't have done, and da 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 da, and all that, and you should have, and I can't believe this, and everybody at the church, y'all just there, the there, the there. So you go through all of that, and then the person gets to church and can't understand why they can't worship. And then they think it's them, but they're fighting your words in the spirit. They're fighting against the label. That's why it's so, you have to be careful because the next time you visibly fall, imagine having to fight through everybody in this room about what they said about what you did. If you had to line up and physically fight everybody in the room, You've already made a mistake. And you have to fight your way through that. Only to turn around and have to fight all the stuff you didn't know was said about you. And your mind doesn't know the difference. Let's be clear. Your mind doesn't know the difference. So... When you're talking to your friend and you're like, oh, my goodness, she not this and she, and I can't believe she did that and all this other stuff. Your mind doesn't know that's just for the moment. Your mind doesn't know you're just talking about this isolated situation. And so then you wonder why every time she comes around now, you uneasy. Why you don't really want to be bothered. Why you don't really want to fool with them. Because your mind doesn't know the difference. Your mind was not built for idle words. Your mind takes everything you say seriously. Good or bad. And then it creates roadways in your mind. It creates paths. It creates spaces. So then when you're in the doctor's office, because you've created this negative space, you've created this space in your mind where everything is always wrong. Ugh, come here. Stand right there. You. Come on, baby. So this is everything is always wrong. Okay? Come here, Miss King. That's, don't nothing ever go right for me. God don't never hear me. Come on. Yeah, you. Come on, miss. Come on. God don't never hear me. So it, it clumps up together. And it just holds on. To the next time you standing in the doctor's office. But, but Sunday, you decided to say, oh, you know what? God is faithful and he's going to heal me. Okay, so come on, miss you. 
So God is faithful. He's going to heal me. So you just have one small, narrow path to God is going to heal me. But you have a wide and clumped together. He ain't never, God don't never hear me. He ain't never going to do nothing. God don't see me. So, because your mind's not set up for idle words, when you get in front of the doctor and he says, we found something, your mind says, you about to die. And connects with the thought that you've had the most. It gets in the car and it connects to the thing that you've said the most. It goes and finds the thing that is familiar to itself. And then it hooks up with it. And then God forbid we don't read our Bible. We don't pray. We don't nothing. So I only get a little sprinkle on Sunday morning or Wednesday night when I decide to come to church. When he says God is a healer. Your mind stays there. Till service is out. Then it goes right back over here. Because I ain't enough over there to draw it back to what the fact of the matter is. See, this is a bunch of lies. But your mind doesn't know the difference between lie and truth. Your head will not decide What's the lie and what's the truth? It'll take it. It takes it all as fact. Hence, when somebody tells you something about somebody and then you find out it's not true, you still believe it. Girl, she's just a thief. You know, she took all my money, she took all my stuff, and then, and then you know what, girl? She didn't even do that. I had just misplaced it. And I just, but you know what? I think she's still a thief. She just didn't steal my stuff. It, it doesn't know the difference. It doesn't know the difference. So now negativity is your go-to. Because you created all these paths and your car is driving and you hear the word, you hear the word, but you didn't hear it enough. So it bypasses the little bit of words you have and comes back to the negativity and connects to it. Then it holds on to it. So then the next time you're in service, Bishop got to spit on you. He got to lather you down to quiet your thoughts so that then you believe. And then you're really not running on what God said. You're running on what Bishop said. So Bishop said it, I believe it. He, he said it, so I, I believe it. So we're going to add, come on, Miss Young. So Bishop said it, so I, I believe it. So we're going to connect right here. Come on, connect right there. If you had a choice, who would you take in a fight? This side or that side? If you had a choice, who you taking? Your mind had a choice. This is who it took. Uh, in the fight of your life, it picked this. In the fight of your children's life, it picked this. In the fight of your life for your ministry, to stay where you are, to not be offended, to do what God called me to do, it chooses this. Then the thing about it is, it gets a hold of you. Grab my shirt. It gets a hold of you. And then you're dragging it everywhere you go. You're just dragging it. Then your clothes look too small. That's what you look like when you come in looking heavy and tired and woe out. That's because your mind is whipping you. 
They don't have, your body not tired? Your body fighting your mind because it's dragging all this stuff with it. Your, your head is hurting because you've been up all night thinking about what ain't right. Your side's hurting. You waking up tired, go to sleep, sleep for 10 hours. Wake up still tired. Your mind been fighting you all night. This ain't never going to work. He ain't never going to act right. I shouldn't have married him. I shouldn't have done this. This is a mess. I don't know why I go to Harvest Church. Every time I turn around, Bishop saying, give, give, give. I don't know what I, Lord have mercy. I can't give no more. I don't have nothing else to give. I don't, then you require me to be holy. What else I'm going to do? I done gave you all my money. Now we at another, now we at Appreciation Sunday. Now we at Impact Sunday. Now we at, and we, and I'm still giving, and I'm still, and I'm still, and what about, and what about, and what about, out. Just let me go. Do that for a week and tell me you're not tired. Do that for two days on top of having children, on top of having a husband, on top of having something else. But see, the thing about these thoughts, come on, group, y'all switching sides, y'all switching teams. So the thing about godly thoughts, stand right here. Uh-uh, everybody stand together. The thing about this is, the thing about this, the thing about this, your mind will take the principal thing you've heard and surround it. Put your arms on me. It'll take that God is a healer. Give me your other hand. And it'll surround it. And then it'll take the weapon formed against you shall prosper. Then it'll take, you are made in the image and likeness of God. So sickness cannot manifest. I am a healer. I am what I am. I am the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I'm a miracle worker, a sign generator, and a wonder. And it'll surround you. And before you know it, peace has ascended. So now, I'm not carrying thoughts. My thoughts are carrying me. You can have a seat. Thank you. So now what I believe is carrying me. I think sometimes we skip over the word section, the confession session. I think we need to spend a little more time sometimes in what you say and how you say and when you say. I think we need to stay there sometimes. Because you say, girl, church was good, but why did she wear that? You've negated yourself. Girl, church was good, but I didn't see so-and-so. You know, I really like it when Bishop come. Wiped your thought. Girl, I, you know what? I'm just going, you know, I'm really hungry, and I was really hungry all through service. Yeah, she was good, she was good, but I'm hungry. Now you've eradicated what was present. So remember when I said sometimes silence is best because it may just be protecting your seed. Wow. That was good. And I'm going to write that one down for myself. (laughs) Thank you, Holy Spirit. Silence. The silence you have in your life, the silence you may have in your car, the silence you may have with your husband may be protecting the seed that you pray God drop on him. Your silence may protect it. So you have to be purposeful in the speech. You have to realize the power that you have as a full-fledged miracle as a sign generator, that your mind is not set up. You weren't created for stress. To be made in the image and the likeness of God, you weren't created for stress. That's why your body breaks down when it's under it. Nothing about you was set up to worry. God wasn't a worrier, and he was sending his child to death. 
and then had to watch it. So what are you worried about? And I'm talking to myself, for real. You know, this is me. Don't take it personal. I'm talking to me. What am I worried about? I had to watch my son die. And I didn't sweat it at all. But I got a bill that I'm concerned about. It's going to keep me up. I got st- other stuff that I'm concerned about that's going to keep me up. Not, not when I have the power that I have. Not when you said I'm made in the image and the likeness of God. Not when you said that greater is he. Greater is he that is in me. So I have to tell myself and I that me are going to line up. I have to look at me, myself, and I and say, you don't get a decision to pick being by yourself. You you don't get a decision. Me, you don't get a decision to say, eh, nobody thinks about me. Nobody calls me. Nobody, did. myself, you don't get an opportunity to say, I'm all alone in this. Nobody has me. Nobody. I wonder if you were with a friend and they were going through something, and they're standing right next to you, and they said, nobody's ever with me, and you're standing right there. How would that make you feel? So how does God feel every time you make the accusation that you're by yourself? Every time you make the accusation that nobody's concerned or cares about you? My whole child died. I don't care. Open heaven. First one is confidence. The second one is hearing should be totally and utterly redefined. Third, miracles. Somebody should be following you. Somebody should be willing to drop the messiness of this fish. Somebody should be able to be dropping their whatever is going on in their lives to follow you as you follow God. Signs. There should be some signs happening. Something. You should be a sign generator to people around you that God is a wonder. And then people wonder. Last one will stand in awe of God because of you. So now open heaven. I hope. I pray has a different meaning. That, God, I'm not necessarily looking for you to bless me with stuff because an open heaven means you bless me with you. And because you bless me with you, there is a power I walk in. There is a a newness I walk in. There is, there's a new level of you that I walk in, that I am constantly guarding. Like my husband, there is no way, and I don't care where you came from, there's no way he's going to let you get to me. Not ever. Not ever. Like in a room, I'm not concerned. He's there. Because he'll fight anybody. I'm almost willing to say he may try to fight God. That's how I know him. So you know God that much? That no matter what comes, he's always going to guard you. No matter how far away he may seem. That he's always going to guard you. That if I call his name, whether I'm in the hallway standing right next to him, or 10 miles down the road, he would hear it. Something in him was going to hear it, and he would get to me. How much more would God do that for you? How much more over an open heaven do you have access to that? How much more so now? So I pray that I have said something that got you thinking. Not necessarily to shout and be excited, but now you're thinking. And that you want to go home and dig. 
and that you want to go home and cancel some of the words you've said. That you want to pull that back. I rescind the word I spoke over my child. I take back what I said about my friend. I cancel what that word would do over myself. Because a lot of times you give more grace to other people than you do yourself. And God, Satan wouldn't be telling you what you're not if you were. So why is, God, why is Satan feeling so obligated to tell you who you are not? Because you are. There's no need to tell me you can't read if you know you can't read. But if I convince you that you can't read and I know you can, now I have control. 